is brought to you by Dodge Cars and Trucks. On the street or off the road, it's the new spirit of Dodge. Hi everyone, I'm Bob Jenkins. Welcome to Speed Week as we kick off the month of May. Now be sure to stay tuned following our show, A Full Night of Racing. Thursday Night Thunder includes a special program called The Road to Indy, which can be seen at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, then Off-Road Racing and NASCAR Modifies at 9, followed by Live USAC Midgets at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. This Sunday on ESPN, we'll televise live the Winston 500 Winston Cup race at Talladega. Now, several questions surround that event. How will the new Chevy Lumina perform in its first outing? And how fast, or should we say how slow, will the cars go with the new restrictor plate? Well, slower than last year, but maybe not as slow as some had thought. The smaller plate has drivers talking among themselves, and you have to look hard to find anyone who has a favorable comment. They took a good rule and, and messed with it a little bit more, and I made it a bad rule, I think. The thing, one inch restricted the plate, the cars were back up and uh, had pretty good feel to them. You know, we'd have been right around 200 mile an hour here qualifying, and that would made all of us real happy, and the fans too. So I just think they over uh, overdone it this time. Waltrip in the new Lumina clocked a 189 and a half earlier today in practice. That's about two and a half miles an hour slower than Mark Martin, who had fast time, and two miles an hour slower than teammate Jeff Bodine, who had the fastest Lumina. Dale Earnhardt, well, he could only find a little over 180, fifth slowest overall. Rusty Wallace also struggled, clocking only a 186.3. Speeds and handling are also going to be affected by new spoiler rules from NASCAR. Rear spoilers can be laid down for extra speed during qualifying, but have to be raised for stability during the race. After a morning practice period, they started to qualify, but rain interrupted it. Twelve, however, did qualify, led by Neil Bonnet at 192.189 miles an hour. Second quickest was Darrell Waltrip, followed by Harry Gant, Phil Parsons, and Rick Wilson. So speeds are about 7 miles an hour slower than last year and 20 miles an hour slower than two years ago. So why doesn't NASCAR allow the cars to run as fast as they can? Well, we've seen three incidents, Bobby Allison at Talladega, Richard Petty at Daytona, and Dale Earnhardt in a Grand National car at Daytona that have proven stock cars can't handle speeds over 190. Here's Benny Parsons with some thoughts and opinions. NASCAR's attitude, and rightly so, is we've got to do whatever is necessary to keep the race cars on the ground, and reducing speed is the easiest way. Which do the drivers prefer, racing at 210 or 190 miles per hour? Well, I think they'd all like to race at 190, but most want that feel of 650 horsepower it, that it takes to run 210 miles per hour. And the veterans have spent years honing their skills to be able to handle anything the track throws at them. At 190, they fear the experience advantage is diminished. Next, the fans, what do they want? They want to see a good race, cars bumper to bumper, side by side. And if their favorite driver happens to be running second, they want him to be able to pull out and pass. Now, if all this happens, the fans will be delighted. But if the car is unable to pull out and pass and must run in single file, bored. That's the word. My personal opinion is we're going to see a great race. I mean, folks, let's face it, most teams haven't had a great deal of cheer about in 89 and they feel a victory at Talladega could turn the season around. Thanks, Benny, and we'll see how things go at 2 o'clock Eastern Time Sunday afternoon. Join us for the Winston 500. Now, the day before, ARCA will run a 500-kilometer race, which we're taping and will air Friday morning, May 12th at 12.30 Eastern. Jerry Churchill scheduled to debut an 89 Chrysler LeBaron in that event. Now, Chrysler is hoping to find success, much like they had in the Winston Cup Stock Car Racing Series in the 60s and 70s. That's the subject of this week's Dick Wallen Racing Classic. In NASCAR's 40-year history, Chrysler products have won nearly a third of the championships. Most of their success has come with the Petties. In the 50s, Lee Petty won two championships. And son Richard won in a Dodge or Plymouth a total of six times in the 60s and 70s. This was a storied era in Winston Cup racing as a battle raged among the big three Detroit automakers. Chrysler would definitely leave its mark with the ultra-powerful and somewhat controversial Hemi engine and those awesome-looking high-wing Superbirds, the first Winston Cup car above 200 with Buddy Baker driving. And Bobby Isaac set a land speed record with this car at the Bonneville Salt Flats. Probably the most memorable year for Chrysler came in 1967 when Richard won an incredible 27 races in the Winston Cup division. No man has ever won as many races in one season. 
It was also around this time that Chrysler convinced the King to try his hand at drag racing in this Barracuda. The last time a Chrysler product won a Winston Cup championship was with Petty in 1975. And with Chrysler's former head of racing, Larry Rathgev, joining forces with the Petty clan, could it mean the return of Chrysler to Winston Cup racing? So is Chrysler considering getting back into Winston Cup racing? Well, Chrysler's motorsports director, Dick Maxwell, tells me, unfortunately, no. None of their models meet NASCAR's wheelbase or front-end requirements, and to make a car that would meet those specifications would cost too much money. It was Bobby Allison weekend at Pennsylvania International Speedway last Saturday and Sunday, so it was appropriate that Bobby's former Winston Cup teammate would win. This was the second appearance for the Bush Grand National Cars at Nazareth, and like last year, a capacity crowd turned out and watched what would be a crash-filled race. This wreck involves the black car of Joe Bessie, Mark Martin, and the number two car of Aldi Ottinger. No one was injured in this or any of the 11 caution periods during the day. Pole sitter Tommy Houston was the early leader. Late laps would boil down to a battle between Bobby Hillen Jr. and Michael Waltrip. Hillen's late race pit stop gave the lead to Waltrip, but Michael couldn't hold it. A fuel pickup problem forced him to stop nearly 20 laps from the finish. From that point on, Hillen was in the driver's seat, able to cruise to an easy victory, the series' seventh winner in as many races. Tommy Ellis finished second. There at the end, we pitted with 60 laps to go, and I saw that Michael didn't pit, and so I knew he was going to have to pit again, and unfortunately, we got a bad set of tires. We, the stagger was bad, and we pushed real bad, but he had to pit, and so we still were running fast enough to win the race. The car ran super. The crew did a super job, and, you know, when the car runs this good, it makes my job a little bit easier. And on Saturday at Nazareth, Danny Sullivan won round two of the International Race of Champions. Speed Week is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. By Dodge Cars and Trucks, on the street or off the road, it's the new spirit of Dodge. And by Bridgestone Tires, Bridgestone builds confidence. Next, a talk with a three-time Indy 500 winner. Back in 1911, the doors swung open for the first Indianapolis 500-mile race, and except for the war years, they've been doing so ever since. The track officially opens for practice this Saturday for the 73rd running of the greatest spectacle in racing with an unusually large number of questions and issues. Undoubtedly, by the end of the first week of practice, crucial questions about the track's new surface will be answered. How much will speeds increase? And will the 225-mile-an-hour barrier be broken? How will the Goodyear radials take to the new surface, especially for a 500-mile race? In just over a week, the competitors will fight it out during what's commonly known as pole day. Will Roger Penske enjoy the same success with the new PC-18s as he did last year with the PC-17s? and put his trio of drivers, Rick Mears, Danny Sullivan, and Alan Zer Sr. on the front row again. An improved Buick engine, which already enjoys a turbocharger boost advantage under USAC regulations, will be back with a larger contingency, including former winners Tom Sneva and Gordon Johncock, as well as last year's surprise, Jim Crawford. Can the American automaker repeat its 1985 qualifying success story, or even better, record its first win? As far as drivers are concerned, the most asked question right now is whether John Paul Jr. will be back. The former IMSA champion has not been in an IndyCar since 1985, having spent the last two and a half years in prison on drug charges. Paul has reportedly been offered a ride this year, but as of yet has not applied to USAC for a license. Finally, the question we will have to wait until May 28th for an answer, who will win the 1989 Indianapolis 500? Will Mears or Johnny Rutherford join Unzer and A.J. Foyt as the only four-time winners? Or will a new face be added to the Borg Warner Trophy? Well, here's somebody who would love to know the answer to the question, can Johnny Rutherford win his fourth? It's J.R. himself. Can you? Well, Bob, I, I certainly feel like I can. I have an extremely good situation coming in with John Menard, who is coming back to IndyCar racing after a couple of years off. Phil Casey is a crew chief. Uh, Franz Weiss is doing our engines. We have a new 89 Lola. 
Cosworth engines, so I, I think we can. You know, it's just to just get out there and see. But really, wouldn't you rather have a Chevy? Aren't they going to dominate <laughs> again? <laughs> well, they certainly have in the past. Uh, you know, when they when the Chevrolet finally came online, they made themselves known, and they have dominated the racing for the last, uh, well, starting its second year now. So, yes, uh, the Chevrolet is, is the guy to beat, and uh, I would love to have one, but it's <laughs> not to be at this point. Speed. What's it going to take this year? We've got a lot of factors, including new pavement and a new tire from Goodyear. Yes, uh, Goodyear has developed a new front tire to go with the, the tire they had uh, last year for the rear tire, and it's, and it's making the cars respond much better. I've heard a lot of good comments from the engineers and a lot of the drivers that have tested uh, the new paving. We always see the, the guys go faster when the tracks are repaved. So, uh, you know, that's the situation where we're going to have to wait and see. Rick Mir says the, he thinks 225 is going to be the new track record. And uh, the other side of the spectrum is making the race, you know, getting in uh, for, to the bottom side of it. Is it going to be 210, 215? You know, you've got to wait and see, I guess. But uh, it is going to be quick. Undoubtedly new records, though, at the Speedway this year. I would, I would think that uh, unless something else happens, yes, definitely new records. Well, we hope you're one of the ones that make the starting field and wish you a lot of good luck. Thank you. And Johnny will also assist us on our three days of Indy 500 qualification coverage. Sunday, May 14th, and Saturday, May 20th, our coverage will be from 5.30 to 7 Eastern Time. And on the last day, Sunday, May 21st, when the bumping process will be going on, our coverage will be from 5 until 7 Eastern Time. Ten rookies took advantage of an early practice period last weekend, trying to clear their first hurdle in the month of May. Those ten enthusiastic rookies took part in USAC's rookie orientation program last weekend all hoping to hit the jackpot that will earn them a spot in this year's 500 field. Making the field may be tougher than ever this year. Speeds are expected to be much higher than last year. Scott Pruitt passed up the Saturday session because of the IROC race in Pennsylvania, then came back on Sunday to complete the test and turn in the fifth fastest speed of the meet at over 205. Steve Butler breezed through his four phases. So did Bernard Jourdain, who was overall fastest at over 209 and a half. Didier Taze is wondering what it's going to take to make the starting lineup this year. Well, I did 205 really easy when, in February when the weather was uh, 36 degrees outside. And uh, sure, it's going to be very difficult, but uh, to be in good shape in the race, we have to be between 212 and 215, I think. Now, if Didier is right about it taking 212 to 215 just to make the race, it will mean a field average much above last year's. In 1988, only the front row starters, Mir Sullivan and Al Unser, averaged above 215, and 20 of the 33 starters were under 210. The rookies ran a total, by the way, of 4,052 miles last weekend without incident. Scoring the Indy 500 or any long race isn't an easy job. But now, from the same country that brought you the in-car camera, Australia, comes a new timing and scoring system that's being carefully looked at here in the U.S. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway will try it out this year, but not as its primary system. Grant Tillett and his staff at the Calder Park Thunderdome developed a system called Austime, and they're confident it's race ready. We're here to prove that we can correctly score in time all the happenings that occur on the track through the entire program. The system was first utilized when various NASCAR teams visited Australia in February of 1987. One might think installation at a facility as large as Indianapolis would be a difficult task, but not so. The Speedway has installed thin wires in the track surface at seven different locations on the front stretch. And once a car passes by the location, a signal is transmitted from the passing car and then registered into the system. Not only will Austime calculate lap time and speed, but will supply pit efficiency times and trap speeds. Well, this system varies from all other systems that we know of in the world in that we can time multiple car crossings simultaneously and we can split those cars to within ten thousandths of a second. As a matter of fact, the Austime scoring system can handle 16 cars crossing the line at the same time. Now, NASCAR says it will come to Indianapolis later this month to observe the system firsthand. Roger Penske set one record as a car owner last year and stands a good chance of setting another one this year. All of this can be explained by auto racing historian Donald Davidson. Thanks, Bob. Well, there's no question that the most successful car owner over the past decade has been Roger Penske. His win in the 500 last year marked his fourth in the last five outings, a phenomenal record. Well, this year he can tie another record by winning for a third consecutive year. 
That's only been done once, and the car owner's name was Lou Moore. A former driver whose best finish at the Brickyard was second in 1928, Moore dominated Victory Lane like no other owner after World War II. In 1947, and again in 1948, Moore's Blue Crown Specials took the top two spots in the Memorial Day Classic, thanks to Maury Rose and Bill Holland. Rose emerged victorious both times, but it took a misguided pitboard signal for the three-time winner to record his easy win in 47. In 1949, Holland gained revenge to earn his only 500 win, but the third straight for Ona Moore. In 40 years since, no one has duplicated that feat, and only one other team, Leader Cards, has managed to place teammates first and second in 1962. Had it not been for the accident that eliminated Danny Sullivan last year, Penske might have recorded the first ever 1-2-3 finish. However, fate always seems to play a crucial role in the unfolding of the Indianapolis 500. Holland had just relinquished the lead to Johnny Parsons in the 1950 race when rain brought the event to an early ending. That twist of fate kept Moore out of victory lane for a fourth straight time. One of the hottest sprint car drivers in the country this year is Doug Wolfgang. This veteran campaigner has teamed with a young car owner and builder to win half the USA event so far and three times with the World of Outlaws. 27-year-old Brian Schnee builds the cars from shops about three miles from Wolfgang's home in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The Schnee chassis has only been around four years, but last year it won over half the races it competed in and captured three track championships. Now, Doug is Brian's brother-in-law, but there are few family feuds here. In fact, success is built on communication. It gives me a lot of input on uh, what, he, what he thinks I should do, and then we just kind of talk about it and go from there, you know. I make some of the decisions, and, but he gives me a lot of input, you know, as far as uh, the tube heights and motor setback. And, you know, he's got a lot of experience, so it help, helps me out quite a bit. I want to be a race car driver. But in my free time, I don't mind messing around bending the pipe and fitting it and welding it together. In fact, I kind of like it. It's, it's kind of like my, uh, I go home to South Dakota and it's kind of like my release. I don't really like to fish. I like to work on my own race cars. But it's behind the wheel of a race car that Wolfie is most comfortable. Now, the third player in this combination is 21-year-old owner Danny Peace, who made the trip with the rest of the crew to Knoxville, Iowa last weekend for a World of Outlaw race. Yes, I said World of Outlaw race. So what's this USA car doing here? Well, it belongs to USA investor Sammy Swindell, who's here after a USA rainout in it. He was later released. The A main now. Doug is outside of row one next to Bobby Davis Jr. Sammy is outside row two next to brother Jeff. Doug sails away, builds up a huge lead, and appears to be headed for another win. Four laps from the finish, Sammy catches Doug, takes the low road around some slower traffic, and takes the lead. Doug has to settle for second tonight as Swindell goes on to win in the organization that he had earlier said he would not compete in. Fan reaction to the victory is mixed. And his commitment to USA doesn't sound as strong now as it used to be. Well, we're going to, you know, run the USA races and... Um you know, run whatever we can. Um, you know, we're just going to try to go out and uh, win every weekend. That's what we're that's what we're trying to do, and we're going to try to win the USA Championship. We're leading it right now, and we're going to try to stay there. There are rumors circulating that as of May 10th, the USA will cease operation. However, a spokesman for USA told me the rumors are not true. It's business as usual. And finally this evening, speed. There's a lot of super speedway activity during the month of May, Talladega this weekend, later the Indianapolis 500, and speed is on everyone's mind. Now, to some sanctioning bodies like NASCAR or the NHRA, speed is a scary thought, but to fans, it's exciting. However, recent developments lead us to believe that the element of speed in racing is being taken away from us. Since the beginning of the automobile, manufacturers have wanted to prove and test their product, and speed was the way to do it. It started on Ormond Beach on the east coast of Florida, and later moved to the Bonneville Salt Flats of Utah. 
the need for speed became intoxicating, not only for the drivers of those land speed record cars, but also for the public. Young Southern Californians used the land speed record drivers as role models in developing hot rodding, a trend which was to spread across the United States. The passion for automobiles and speed continued to grow. Wally Park saw this and formed the National Hot Rod Association. So too did Bill France, who took stock car racing off the beaches and onto the super speedways. And Tony Holman saved the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and is responsible for making IndyCar racing what it is today. Over the years, speed on the racetrack has increased. In drag racing last year, Eddie Hill broke the five-second barrier for the first time. And just this year, Connie Kalita came closest to breaking the magic 300-mile-an-hour barrier with a 291 and a half. Two years ago, Bill Elliott went faster than any man has ever gone before in a stock car, 212.809 at Talladega. And three years ago, Rick Mears did a 223 in qualifying for the Michigan 500. But today's world is a very complicated one, where lawyers and insurance companies rule. For these reasons and possibly others, NASCAR has decided that restrictor plates are necessary to hold down speeds on the super speedways. The NHRA in a recent article announced that due to insurance reasons, it doesn't want to reach the 300 mile an hour mark and next year plans to limit rear end gear ratios. Now with new paving at Indianapolis, many expect the track record to be shattered. But this may be the last time we'll see a major speed barrier broken. Speed is exciting for everybody, but in my opinion, competition is exactly what the race fan pays his money to see. And that's it for this edition of Speed Week. Remember, a full night of racing yet to come. Next, the road to Indy. So long, everyone. Speed Week has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. By Yokohama, one of the world's largest tire manufacturers. And by Bush Beer, the beer with a taste as smooth as its name.